Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today is a special uh, talk with all of us because the whole Muslim world is celebrating the birth of the Prophet وسلم, Muhammad, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to be a savior of humanity and mankind and in whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, guaranteed the existence of his book of revelation as well as the continuous prayer upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels. I start with thanking my colleague uh, Ahmad Shawa for helping me to prepare the uh, scientific and media presentation. So, uh, 16 years ago, I wrote a document called uh, The Silent Truth. It is on 25th of November, 2004. And I put in it my vision for what's happening to the world at that time. Today, I would like to let you to be patient with me because I'm going to read a lot today of references talking about Islam, what people said about Islam, what people said about Quran, and what people said about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 16 years ago, this was my introduction of my document, I am said, the world today is beset by a new phenomenon to create a world in which religion is excluded from the major role it has always played in the expansion of civilization. Few can deny the importance of religion throughout history and throughout human development. One can go so far as to say that without religious codes, society would not have developed at the rapid and successful pace at which it has all the things which we today take for granted would have been luxuries to which we would still be aspiring. The concept of religion and what constitutes religion, religious belief, has adapted since the creation of life and the creation of man, creation of life before man. Today we have new religions, which we sometimes fail to, per to perceive as new religions. We have liberalism, modernism, Marxism, and even secularism, which in its own way is a form of religion, a form of religion. And this was my discussion long time ago. This may be described as earthly religions instead of heavenly religions, such as Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Whatever our beliefs may be, however, there is a conf confrontation against all religion. All religions are under attack. Nowhere is this more pronounced than in the vitriol heap against Islam. This is what I wrote 16 years ago. Despite this confrontation, my purpose on producing this booklet, which I'm reading from, is not to defend Islam. I don't believe Islam need def needs defending, but it is time to set the record straight. To do that, I will allow others who have come before me to speak about Islam in the language that is understood by all of you, by all, all, all of you. I consider this to be the first step on the long road of, to acceptance of plurality, plurality. It is this plurality of life which will allow us to excel according to our intellects, abilities, histories, cultures, faith, and religions. We are merely taking the first step here the importance of this step, however, cannot be overstated, 
we are on a journey of hope and we welcome all those who wish to join us. We do not exclude from this journey of hope anybody who wishes to observe our action. They are welcome to watch and participate whenever they feel they are ready to join us. And they also will be welcome. But to those who wish to prevent us from taking this journey, I have a message. Please rejoice in the fact that even if you choose not to support us or even to hinder our progress, okay, we still offer you the fruits of that first step, which we shall take regardless of your action, regardless of your action, regardless of your action. My message is that it is our duty that we not be deterred from actions which can only lead to the development of a society whose bedrock is unity. Unity, unity. This was 25th of November 2004. Why I'm talking about the Prophet Sallallahu today? Does the Prophet need defending? No. Does Islam need defending? No. No. Does Quran need defending? No. Because today, as I mentioned, maybe 16 years ago, we can see people disgraced the religion. If we read some other books of religion written by scholars of other religions, how they were degrading prophets such as Adam, Jesus, the Dimeri, Abraham, and others in these textbooks. Our duty to have full respect, full respect and trust in the messages of all the prophets of God, from Adam السلام, into Muhammad وسلم, no doubt. So we, through our belief and teaching of Muhammad وسلم, have to defend, understand, with those prophets. Freedom of speech is very good, but has to be one size fits all. Freedom of speech could be for me, for you, for her, for us, for anyone in the world. It's not pick and choose. It's not for this group, but not for, uh, for, for the other group. It has to be for all. And we have to define the boundaries of freedom of speech. Radicalism, Extremism and terrorism also should not happen on this planet. We have to fight it collectively, whether we are Muslims or Christian or secular or uh, liberal or whatever you call our religion, Hindu, Sikh, whatever it is. We have to fight it collectively. Crime against innocent people is condemned by all of us, must be condemned by all of us, regardless of the race, regardless of the racial background, regardless of the cultural background. It doesn't affect those individuals at all, and it should not actually affect innocent people. We're well, sorry to see what's happening in Europe, particularly in France, over the last few days. Also, we are sorry to see what's happening to the Uyghur in China, to the Rohingya in Myanmar, to the Kashmiri inside India, to the Yemeni in Yemen, to the Syrian in Syria, to the Palestinian in Palestine, to the people of Democratic Republic of Congo in Congo Democratic Republic, to the people in Chad, to or, or Central African Republic, to the people in north of Kenya of, of Nigeria, to the people in Somalia to the people in South Sudan and to everywhere, extremism, radicalism, terrorism is condemned against any race, any religion done by any group. We should condemn them equally. And this is what we understand from the teaching of the mighty God subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ajma'een, who taught us fairness, equality, social justice for all, for all, for all. 
Today you are going to celebrate the birthday of the greatest man of mankind, the greatest man of humanity, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, according to what has been mentioned about him by other scholars from different religions, about him, about Islam, as well as about the Quran, the Holy Quran. This is what they said about Quran. This Reverend Bosworth Smith, who said, Muhammadanism, which is Islam, Muhammadanism, in Muhammadanism, everything is different here. And instead of the shadowy and the mysterious, we have history. We know of the external history of Muhammad, وسلم, while for his internal history after his mission, had been proclaimed, we have a book. We have a book, Quran. Absolutely unique in its origin, in its preservation on the substantial authority of which no one, on which no one, no one has ever been able to cast a serious doubt about the book of Quran. And this is Reverend Bosworth. Napoleon Bonaparte, everybody knows him, the great conqueror of the great emperor of France. What he said about Quran, I hope the time is not far off when I shall be able to unite all the wise and educated men of all countries and establish a uniform, a uniform a, Uni, uh, uniform regime based on the principles of Quran, 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 which alone are true and which alone can lead men to happiness. Thank you, great emperor of the past. This is Gerald Granger, professor of medical embryology. What he said, in relatively few ayahs, which is verses of Quran, is contained a rather comprehensive description of human development from the time of commingling of the gametes through organogenesis. I studied it when I was doing my doctor of medicine in Birmingham University 30 years ago. No such distinct complete record of human development, such classification, such as classification, terminology, and description existed previously. In most, if not all instances, this description antedates by many, many, many centuries the recording of the various stages of human embryonic and fetal development recorded in the traditional scientific literature. This was being mentioned in the Holy Quran. This is witness on what has been mentioned on the Holy Quran about the human development. Alfred Kronar, professor of department of geosciences, University of Mainz, Germany. What did he say also about science, the earth, the planet, the astronomy? Thinking where Muhammad came from, where Muhammad came from, from Mecca. I think it's almost impossible that he could have known about things like the common origin of the universe. No way. No way. Because scientists have only found out within the last few years with very complicated and advanced technological methods that this is the case. If you combine all this, and you combine all these statements that are being made in the Quran and a Quran in terms that relate to the earth and the formation of earth and science in general, you can basically say the statements made there in many ways are true, are true, are true. They can now be confirmed by scientific methods. And in a way, you can say that the Quran as a book, Quran as a book, is a simple science 
textbook for the simple man living on earth. Simple sign textbook for the simple man. And that many of the statements made in there in the Quran at the time could not be proven, but that modern scientific methods are now in a position to prove what Muhammad in his birthday said 1400 years ago. That is Alfred Kroner. What about Islam? This is the Quran. What about Islam? Prince Charles, 1993, said, our judgment of Islam has been grossly distorted by taking the extremes to the norm, to be the norm. That is a serious mistake. It's like judging the quality of life in Britain by the existence of, um, of murder and rape, child abuse and drug addiction. The extremes exist and they must be dealt with. But when used as basis to judge society, when used as basis to judge society, they lead to distortion and unfairness. When used as basis to judge a society, it, they lead to distortion and unfairness. Bless you, Prince Charles. Slam also. This is Montgomery Watt. What did he say? I'm not a Muslim in the usual sense, though I hope I am a Muslim as one surrender to God. But I believe that embedded in the Quran and other expressions of the Islamic vision are vast stores of divine truth from which I and the other Occidentals have still much to learn, have still much to learn, have still much to learn. And Islam is certainly a strong contender for the supplying of the basic framework of the one religion of the future. Thank you, Montgomery Watt. Donald Rockwell, the universal brotherhood of Islam, regardless of race, politics, color, or country, has been brought home to me most keenly many times in my life. And this is another feature which draw me towards the faith, the faith, the faith, the faith. Edward Gibbon and Simon Oakley said, Mohammedans, Mohammedans are the Muslims. It's the old name for, for the Muslims. Mohammedans have uniformly withstood the temptation of reducing the object of their faith and devotion to a level with the senses and imagination of man. Senses and the imagination of man is above that, above that, above that. I believe, as they said, in one God and Muhammad, the obstacle of God, is a simple and invariable profession of Islam. Very simple, very simple profession of Islam. The intellectual image of the deity has never been degraded by any visible idol. The honors of the Prophet وسلم, have never transgressed have never transgressed the measure of human virtue. And his living precepts have restrained the gratitude of his disciples within the bounds of reason and religion. Reasoning on one side and religion on one side. That is what Edward Gibbon and his colleague Simon Oakley mentioned about the religion. 100 great lives within its range of some 60 years, the whole gamut of human experience seems to have been played through. Through, see what, what the Prophet and the Islam have done from poverty to riches, from failure to success, from friendlessness to you to unquestioned power, 
from persecution to kingly authority. By inspiration, Muhammad Sallallahu awoke religious life in the East amongst a humanity sunk in the depth of ignorance and the profligacy. During the years of 609 to 632, the light of faith flashed out from the sincerity of his heart, the heart of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and heralded one of the mightiest movements that have ever influenced the history of the whole world. The history of the whole world. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al Huda. That was 100 great lives. Now we move to the third part of our talk, which is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad, the human being, Muhammad, the prophet, and Muhammad, the teacher of humanity forever. Before we go to say, to, to read what others said about him, let us see what is the structure of his personality and the dimension of his personality. I wrote this one uh, two weeks ago when I was thinking about the dimensions of the prophet's personality. Nine dimensions. I call them the multiplicity of the multiple dimensions of Muhammad's وسلم, personality. Who is he? We all know that he is the messenger of God and he is the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No way, khalas. What are the dimensions? Nine. Nine, nine. Let us talk about them one by one before we say how the people talked about Muhammad Sallallahu Internal dimension, it has four principal dimensions. And his four principal internal dimensions are searching for the ultimate truth, contemplation and reflection on the great creation of Allah, self-worship and purification for thought on people's affairs. This is the internal. This was his, his burden to look about these four internal dimensions in his personality. Circumferential, surrounding him, because he has to look about what is going around him. Dimension, circumstantial, social dimension is about what? To deal with family, relatives and friends, community and tribes. Through his manners, behavior, credibility, integrity, transaction, and dealing with the public, because he has to be a member of a greater society, have to interact with them. This is a circumferential dimension of the character of the Prophet Sallallahu or the personality of the Prophet Diagonal dimension, forward-looking and vision. He was a visionary by all means, and we all know that. And in his diagonal, visionary dimension and forward-looking dimension, we see it has a political aspect, social, religious, theological, economical, historical, and traditional leadership on local, regional, and international level. This is the diagonal or the forward-looking or the vision of the Prophet ﷺ, which we call it diagonal dimension of the personality of the Prophet ﷺ. Number four, the unseen, which is al-ghayb, 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 ilm al-ghayb, or alam al-ghayb. The unseen dimensional existence and the power of the Creator, where unexplained phenomena could happen to support his mission on any other, any, anybody else. This unseen and al-ghaybi has to be a part of his personality as well. Number five, the vertical di dimension, up, going up, up, no barrier between him and the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he always finds himself in direct contact and proximity of the ultimate source of power, knowledge, guidance, wisdom, soul, and self-satisfaction. We don't have mediator. We don't have somebody in the middle who take from you something to be going to the God, talk about you on behalf of you. No. It's ultimate relationship, that relationship between the slave of Allah and the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sixth dimension, number six, lower and the underlying dimensions. Talk about what? About dealing about the forgotten creations of Allah. Animals, birds, insects, habitat, water, climate, and others. 
He has to look after this. And in his history and his traditional speeches, he was talking about this as well. Number seven, cross-cutting dimension, dealing with the risk-taking measures and action taken to protect different components of society. I also have to be interactive with every component of society. That's what actually uh, another dimension of his character. Number eight, trans-dimensional transformative dimension. Trans-dimensional transformative. Professor Asallam, through this, he was trying to find solution for humanity. And this dimension in his, in his personality was dealing with the creation of pioneering, innovative, creative, sustainable solutions for different social problems. Different social problems, different social problems. Number nine, holistic dimension. Philosophical and the cultural. So he has to understand the philosophy and the culture of the people living with them or the people who are trying to save them or the people who try to teach them and uh, guide them. Dealing with the culture of the process of the process of what? The process of the climate of social change. Even the climate, the, the social change has a process and a climate. He has to understand the culture and the philosophy of the process of the climate of social change and justice. And these are the nine dimensions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have to mention this to you, to let each one of us to look deep at the quality of the character and the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from different dimension. I mentioned nine. I want you to add as much as you want. Now we'll go to see what they said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, today at his birthday, this gentleman, his name is James Mishner. What he said, Muhammad, the inspired man who founded Islam, was born 570 AD into an Arabian tribe that worshipped idols, okay? Orphaned at birth. He was always particularly solicitous of the poor and needy the widow and the orphan, the slave and the downtrodden. At 20, he was already a successful businessman and soon became a director of a camel caravan, of camel caravans for a wealthy widow, Khadija. Once he reaches the age of 25, his employer, Khadija, recognizing his merit, proposed marriage. She proposed his marriage even though she was 15 years older than him. He married her, and as long as she lived, remained a devoted husband to a woman who was 15 years older than him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with that. Like almost every major prophet before him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fought shy of serving as a transmitter of God's word sensing his own inadequacy too heavy on him to spread the message of God subhanahu wa ta'ala but the angels Jibreel alayhi salam commanded him read 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 so far as he know as we know Muhammad was unable to read and write but he began to dictate those inspired words which would soon revolutionize a large segment of the earth. Not only his tribe, not only his family, not only the Arabia. A large segment of the earth. There is one God, no God but him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In all things, Muhammad was profoundly practical. Practical, practical. Be practical. When his beloved son, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, died, an eclipse happened or occurred, and rumors, rumors of what? Of God's personal condolence quickly arose. Everybody, said, oh, Allah is sending his condolence to the death of Abraham, the son of Muhammad. Whenever Muhammad 
is said to have announced what he said to every one of his followers. An eclipse is a phenomena of nature. A phenomena of nature. It is foolish to attribute such things to the death or birth of a human being. No way. Stop the rumors. In spite of the fact, the rumor came to be about his son, Radhi Alayhi Salaam. At Muhammad's own death, when he died, let us what, see what happened. At Muhammad's own death, an attempt was made to defy him. No, he didn't know. Omar went out screaming and calling sword. Whoever said Muhammad said, I will choke his name to, to cut his throat. But the man who was to become his administrative successor killed the hysteria with one of the noblest speeches in religion, religious history. One of the noblest speeches of religious history. What Abu Bakr said at that time, in full confidence and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, if there, are, if there are any among you who worship Muhammad, if there are any among you who worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. Finished. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if it is God you worship, he lives forever. Worship God, don't worship Muhammad. And he maintained to hold the community of Islam stronger together. 100 great lives. Over 250 million of the world's inhabitants are followers of the religion of Muhammad. The importance of Muhammad, therefore, needs no further emphasis. No further emphasis. We don't need any witness from anybody. We don't need any, any support to say that Muhammad is, is old, whatever it is. No. His life is indeed remarkable. Is indeed remarkable to be understood by his enemy and by his followers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thomas Carlyle talk about Muhammad saying, a silent Great soul, Muhammad is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of that who cannot be earnest. He was to kindle the whole world. To kindle the whole world. The world's maker has ordered so. It's Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Michael Hart. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the secular and the religious level. It's probable that the relative influence of Muhammad وسلم, on Islam has been larger than the combined influence of Jesus Christ and St. Paul on Christianity. It is this unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence which I feel entitles Muhammad وسلم, to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. I say it again. It is this unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence, which I feel, as Michael Hart, entitles Muhammad to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Gandhi, we all know Mahatma Gandhi. I wanted to know the best of, of the life of one who holds today indisputable sway over the hearts of millions of mankind. I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword as you keep teaching you. It was not the sword. It was not the sword. Okay. That won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid, rigid simplicity 
the utter self-effacement of the Prophet Sallallahu the scrupulous regards for pledges, his interpretation, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in Allah and his own mission. This is what won the heart of the people. Those are not the sword carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. This is the witness of Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi the late Mahatma Gandhi as well. Philip Haiti, History of the Arabs. Within a brief span of mortal life, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called forth of unpromising material, a nation never wielded before in the Arabia, in a country that was hitherto, but a geographical expression, it was not a country. He established a religion which in vast areas supersede Christianity and Judaism and laid the basis of an empire that was soon to embrace within its far flung boundaries the fairest, the fairest, the fairest provinces that then civilized world. This is Philip Haiti as well. William Draper, four years after the death of just, just Justinian, which is the emperor in, uh, I think, Constantinople, was born in Mecca, Muhammad, in Arabia. The man who, of all men, has exercised the greatest influence upon human race. The man, the man, the man who, of all men, has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race to be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of human race, may perhaps justify title of the messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Edward Gibbon, the good sense of Muhammad despised the pomp of loyalty. The apostle, the apostle, the apostle of God submitted to the menial office of the family. He was a servant and the helper inside his house. What did he do? He kindled the fire, swept the floor, milked the eaves, and mended his own by his with his own hands his shoes and garments. See it again. Kindled the fire, swept the floor, milked the eaves, and mended with his own hands his shoes and garments. Disdaining the penance and merit of hermit, he observed without effort of vanity the obstemious diet of an Arab. This is how he was helping and being servant and serving his own family at home. Of course, everyone knows who was George Bernard Shaw. He said, I have studied Muhammad وسلم, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far far for and in my opinion, far from being anti-Christ, he must be called, he must be called, he must be called the savior of humanity. I believe that if a man like him were to assume the dictatorship of modern world, he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring it the much needed peace and happiness. I have Prophesied, prophesied about the faith of Muhammad Sallallahu in Islam that it would be acceptable to the Europe of tomorrow, to the Europe of tomorrow, as it is the beginning to be acceptable to the Europe of today. Thank you, uh, George Bernard Shaw. This was his prophecy 
about Islam and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Any Byzant, what did she say? It's impossible for anyone who studies the life and the character of the great prophet of Arabia, who knew how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the great messengers of the Supreme of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And although in what I put to you, I shall say many things which may be familiar to many, yet I myself feel whenever I reread them a new way of admiration to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a new sense of reverence for that mighty Arabian teacher. Thank you, Annie. This is how people understood the noble humanitarian and uh, character of the Prophet Lamartine. He said about Muhammad Sallallahu he is a philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, conqueror of ideas, okay? Restorer of national dogmas, of a cult without images, the founder of the 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lamartin said. As regarded, as regards all standard by which human greatness may be, may be measured, we may well ask a very simple question raised by Lamartine is, is there any man greater than he, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. The answer is and was no. Arthur Glenn Leonard, it was the genius of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the spirit that he breathed into the Arabs through the soul of Islam that exalted them, that raised them from out of the lethargy and low level of tribal stagnation up to the high watermark of national unity and empire. It was in the sublimity of Muhammad's design, daism, the simplicity, the sobriety, and purity, it inc inculcated the fidelity of his founder to his own tenets that acted on their moral and intellectual fiber with all the magnetism of true inspiration. And this is what, how, this is how Arthur Glenn described the character of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he took the Arabs from being the lethargic nation in the middle of darkness and make them what they were after his mission was uh, successful and be believed by all of them. The fourth angle, we talked about Quran, about Islam, about Islam, about Quran, about Islam, about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we talk about the contribution of Islam by Muslims to civilization. I will read this one, it's a quite a long one, but bear with me, please. There was once a civilization that was the greatest in the world. It was able to create a continental super state that stretched from ocean to ocean and from northern climes to tropics and deserts. Within its dominion lived hundreds of millions of people of different creeds and ethnic origin. Thank you. One of its languages became the universal language of much of the world. The bridge between the peoples of hundreds land, of hundred lands. Its armies were made up of people of many nationalities and this military protection allowed a degree of peace and prosperity that had never been known before. The reach of this civilization's commerce, the reach of this commerce, commerce 
extended from Latin America to China and everywhere in between. And this civilization was driven more than anything by what? By invention. How? It's architects designed buildings that defied gravity. It's mathematician created the algebra and logarithm that would enable the building of computers and the creation of encryption. Its doctors examined the human body and found new cures for diseases. Its astronomers looked into the heavens, named the scars, and paved the way for space travel and exploration. Its writers created thousands of stories, stories of courage, romance, and magic. Its poets wrote, the, of, wrote of love when others before them were too steeped in fear to think of such things. When other nations were afraid of ideas, this civilization thrived on them and they kept them alive. When censors threatened to wipe out knowledge from past civilization, this civilization kept the knowledge alive and passed it on to others. Although we are often unaware of our inter indebtedness, indebtedness, indebtedness to this other civilization, it is gifts are very much a part of our heritage. The technology industry would not exist without the contribution of Arab mathematicians, Sufi poet, philosophers such as Rumi, challenged our notions of self and truth. Leaders like Suleiman the Magnificent contributed to our notions of tolerance and civic leadership. And perhaps we can learn a lesson from his example, Suleiman. It was leadership based on merit meritocracy, not inheritance. It was leaders, leadership that harnessed the full capabilities of a very diverse population that included Christianity, Islamic, and Jewish traditions. This kind of enlightened leadership, leadership that, that nurtured culture, sustainability, diversity, and courage. This kind of this kind of enlightened leadership led to 800 years of innovation and prosperity. Leadership that nurtured the culture, sustainability, diversity, and courage. Thank you. In dark and serious times like this, we must affirm our commitment to building societies and institutions that aspire to this kind of greatness, this kind of greatness, more than ever, we must focus on the importance of leadership, hold acts of leadership, and decidedly personal acts of leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Florina. Prince Charles also talked about contribution of Islam. What did he say? Islam nurtured and preserved the quest for learning, the quest for learning, the quest for learning. In the words of tradition, the ink of a scholar, of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of martyr, as the Arabs and Muslims believe. Cordoba, in the 10th century, was by far the most civilized city of Europe. We know of lending libraries in Spain at that time. At the time, King Alfred was making terrible blunders with the culinary arts in his country. It said that the 400,000 volumes in its rural library amounted to more books than all the libraries of the rest of Europe put together. Thank you, Prince Charles, again and again and again. This is what they said about 
his uh, uh, contribution of Islam. Also, he said, carry on, by, by Prince Charles. That was made possible. Because what? Because the Muslim world acquired from China the skill of making paper more than 400 years before the rest of the non-Muslim Europe. That was made possible because the Muslim world acquired from China the skill of making paper more than 400 years before the rest of the Muslim Europe. Many of the traits on which modern Europe prides itself came from the Muslim Spain, such as diplomacy, free trade, open borders, the techniques of academic research, of anthropology, etiquette, fashion, alternative medicine, hospitals, all came from this great city of the cities, Cordoba, and well as Granada. This is what we call about the contribution of Muslims to humanity. Our conclusion today, after talking about all this, four steps we need to look at. I mentioned we have to be equally fair with any act of atrocity against any civilian, equally human rights, maybe, uh, freedom of speech, maybe, and, 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 and. Does not have any distinction between race and creed. Let us be guided by these three eyes. How to deal with the ignorant ones who do not know the value of the messenger of God. For us as Muslims, we have to respect all the messengers of God, no matter what. No matter what, no matter what. This is a part of the solid belief of Islam, as Muhammad Sallallahu told us to respect everybody from Adam, alayhi salam, into Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Okay. But to have to be guided by these three, three uh, ayahs. First one, we said, wa subhu Allah ta'ala wa alhamdulillah, wa subhu Allah ta'ala wa bagayra ilmin, kadayk zayana li kulli ummatna amalawm, thumma darbim marjawam fa nabuim makan yamalawm. And do not insult ever those they invoke other than Allah. Lest they insult Allah in enmity without knowledge. Thus, we have made pleasing to every community their deeds. Then, that they, then to their Lord is their return. And we, he will inform them about what they used to do. So here, should not be dragged by those foolish ignorant individual. Number two, the second verse, the true servants of the merciful one are those who walk on earth gently and when the foolish ignorant one address them, they simply say, peace to you. Ignore them. Ignore them and proceed. The third verse, which we need to talk about, However, it's not necessary for the believers to march forth all at once. If somebody says something bad or does something bad against Muslims, we have to appoint a group of organization to respond while the rest can carry on doing the work they must be doing. What is it? وما كان المؤمنون أن ينفروا كافة فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة يتفقع في الدين ولينذر قامهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحضرون However, it's not necessary for the believers to march forth all at once Only a party from each group should march forth leaving the rest to gain religious knowledge and then enlighten their people when they return to them, so that they too may be aware of evil. So this kind of a specialism, a specialization, somebody can talk about human rights, advocacy, uh, social work, and, 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 and. Number four, which is the last but not least, and while some civil society organizations are dealing with a certain issue, such what we see there today is like Islamophobia, okay? Have to empower the organization, some sort of dealing with Islamophobia and counter-extremism and counter-radicalism. Each of the rest of 
other civil society organizations should proceed with their plan and strategy of what? Of developing, helping, saving their societies. Can stop our progressive achievement and process of change. And while some civil society organizations are dealing with a certain issue, each of the rest of other civil society organizations should proceed with their plan and strategy of developing, helping, saving their societies, building the future of their country, humanity, and Islam. Islam is a value-based, all-inclusive community action oriented, driven, all-inclusive, inclusive of all religion and all races, and not speeches of rhetoric. Islam is not speeches of rhetoric. Don't follow the people who talk too much and do nothing or do little. And do nothing and do little. Thank you very much. And I wish that you can celebrate the uh, birthday of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by being very practical, like he was the most practical man, and he was the man that he was sent to save humanity. We have to be very proud of him, and we have to protect all the messengers of Allah, because we believe and we have full trust in all the messengers of Allah, Subhanahu Wa Taala. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, we'll do the Arabic one, which is very difficult to be done, either Saturday or Sunday, but we'll inform you about it, inshallah, in due course, maybe today or tomorrow, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa